All right. So let's do this. This is an article called How the IMF and the West Debt Trap Senegal. Now, may, maybe you guys don't know uh, much about Senegal, but it's a wonderful place on the on the coast in Africa. I believe it is uh, had a long history with colonialism. Uh, let's dive right in. So as you can see by the chart, uh, out of the 10 African countries with the highest amount of debt to the IMF, Egypt ranks pretty high. But as you can see, uh, Senegal is on the board in the top 10. So Senegal's economic struggles are deeply rooted in the history of Western exploitation from colonial legacies to modern financial entrapment. The 1991 economic crisis in Senegal serves as a stark example of how international financial institutions, particularly the IMF, have contributed to the country's economic woes. Since the early 1980s, Senegal had been implementing IMF-supported adjustment programs with an almost continuous succession of IMF arrangements from 1979 all the way to 1991. Now, while these programs claimed to reduce the macroeconomic imbalances, they failed to stimulate meaningful economic growth, as they do with IMF policies of forced austerity and currency devaluation and, and basically things that just hurt the poorest people in the country. Now, from 1978 to 1993, Senegal's economic growth averaged about a little over 2% per year, which is not a lot. And this is falling short of the 2.8% uh, population growth rate. IMF structural adjustment policies, which emphasize fiscal austerity and market liberalization, uh, trapped Senegal in a cycle of debt and economic stagnation. So the forced liberalization, which is when you can't pay your debts, the IMF insists that you privatize the industries, and that allows the Trojan horse of corporate power to come in and take over these extractive things, whether they're mines or anything like this. So... Um, by 1991, the country was facing a severe economic crisis, largely due to the burden of debt repayments and the inability to invest in critical sectors of the economy. Adding to Senegal's economic challenges is the exploitative nature of its gold industry. Uh, Western mining companies, armed with the superior geological data and financial resources, have an unfair advantage over Senegal in negotiations and operations. So I just wanted to mention that the top industry in Senegal, uh, one of the top commodities is gold. And it mostly goes to Switzerland and the US. It is 900 uh, million a year business. So it's one of their highest fractions on the GDP is gold. And they do a lot of other things. They have fishing and, and things like that. But gold is somewhere where they have had a, a relationship with gold buyers in the West. And the West would pay it close to market value. But the problem is, like I said before, these companies that come in that do the mining that are from the West, they have more data and more resources and more information on the actual gold in the country than the people do, which means there's limited technological transfer, which is something that China actually did. When America came to China, there was a technological transfer. There was supposed to be anyway, where they said, you can come to China. You can do business in China, but you have to tell us uh, what you're doing. What are the technology and uh, technological and uh, proprietary information that you're using to, to make this happen? You have to teach us what is it. And that's the deal. Um, in the case of Senegal, they have yet to have that technological transfer where those companies tell them exactly what they're doing, how they're doing it. And everything like that, because those are the only cards that the West has is saying, well, we'll help you extract it, but we won't tell you how we do it. Uh, it's typical colonial, neo-colonialism. Um, Senegal's total merchandise exports re reached 5 billion in 2022. Merchandise exports from Senegal increased by 9%. Senegal's total merchandise imports amounted to 12 billion. So they have a lot of merchandise that they export. Uh, these are just random facts about Senegal's economy. Gold was Senegal's top export in 2022, valued at 960 million, like I said. Other major exports included phosphoric acid and refined petroleum. So they have vast amounts of resource wealth. Other significant imports include rice, um, 657 million and, and crude petroleum. 
And since the mid-1980s, the fishing sector has emerged as Senegal's principal export activity. So they do pretty good with that. Um, another problem with the West and its relationship to Senegal was an uh, incident of chicken. Okay, I don't eat chicken myself, but maybe many of you do. Uh, the United States is known for its chlorinated chicken, which is banned in the EU and it's banned in a lot of country, other countries. But when they find it hard up to get rid of it, what they do is they pawn it off on a third world country, right? The flooding of Senegal's market with cheap imported chickens, primarily from European countries, became a significant issue in the late 1990s and early 2000s. After Senegal lowered its taxes on poultry imports from 55% in 1998 to 20% in 1999 as part of this forced trade liber liberalization from the IMF, poultry imports skyrocketed just from 1% of domestic consumption to 19%. In two years, by 2004, imports provided 22% of domestic consumption. So this is horrible uh, for the country. And I just want to tell you guys, this is the modus operandi of the West when it comes to their neo-colonial sort of uh, game that they play here by by getting this stuff out. And they ask countries to deindustrialize, okay, privatize, and become sort of hubs, right? In Argentina, they they made them focus on one industry, which they were focused on. Libya was the same thing. There was a time when it was too heavy on petroleum exports. And when the price of oil fell, the entire economy went down the toilet. So the IMF wants it so countries like Senegal don't diversify their um, their exports and be self-sufficient, you know what I mean? To take care of their people, to have food security. No, they say, we want you to buy, uh, we want you to grow only peanuts. And 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 peanuts are a big export there. But what happens when the price of peanuts goes down, you end up with a, a horrible, uh, dangerous sort of uh, economic precariousness where people are forced to buy imports from foreign countries. That's exactly where the IMF wants these people. These influx of cheap imports, mainly frozen chicken cuts from Netherlands, Belgium, Brazil, devastated local producers who couldn't compete. The situation highlighted the economic imbalances between heavily subsidized Western, Western agricultural sectors and developing countries farmers. In response to this crisis and concerns about avian influenza, Senegal implemented a ban on all pol poultry exports in January 2006. So this was the right thing to do. The ban proved effective, reducing imports to just 1% of domestic consumption by 2007. And by 2010, Senegal was producing almost 100% of its own poultry uh, for consumption, demonstrating how protective measures can safeguard against local industries and food sovereignty. Now, I'm a vegan and I understand that uh, chicken is not really great. It's not really great for the environment. It's not good for your health, but it is a food source for people now because we're we don't have a better way and um we don't have the infrastructure to uh do it differently but it's still fascinating to know that um there are countries still struggling with their own food security in 2024 when we have all these industrial methods and they have all these loans from the imf it's incredible that there's this issue so um maybe you've heard of jean ziegler he is a french I'm sorry, uh, Swiss Marxist, um, written some really great books. Uh, th the situation in Senegal is further exacerbated by the persistence of colonial era economic structures highlighted by Jean Ziegler, uh, a former UN rapporteur on the right for food. Uh, he worked for the UN for years. Uh, Ziegler points out that Senegal imports 75% of its rice, a situation that he describes as disastrous for the country's food security. This is dependence on food imports is a direct result of the colonial pact that forces Senegalese farmers to prioritize cash crops like peanuts for export rather than focusing on food self-sufficiency. So exactly what I said. That's not in the best interests of the West to let the countries have a well-balanced economy. No, it's a hub to grow whatever grows best there and 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 extort those resources. Um, 
Jean Ziegler is a notable sociologist and author of his Marxist critiques on global capitalism and his advocacy for the global South. As the UN Rapporteur for the Right to Food from 2000 to 2008, he highlighted the role in multinational corporations and Western policies in perpetuating hunger and poverty. His concept of structural violence explains how economic systems har harm marginalized populations. Um, through his writings, he has challenged you know, the exploitative nature of Western capitalism, and he's actually quite a controversial figure. So, And when it comes to Marxists, he's somebody that I'll listen to. I don't really listen to, you know, kids, angry kids who have meme pages or, or, or stuff like this. I tend to go for people who have something to say about, you know, that, that sounds like information that I don't already know. And it's just not angry chest beating. I mean, I like to get angry and chest beat about capitalism in America. And I do believe in Marxist principles, but uh, you want, you want in-depth information that uh, isn't just, you know, shallow surface level stuff. Um, so Ziegler's observation, they pretty much paint a grim picture of Senegal's agricultural sector. Um, so while the country exports peanuts, it must import three quarters of its food requirements. Recreate, it creates a dangerous imbalance in its agricultural trade. The situation is compounded by the dumping of European food surpluses on African market at artificially low prices, making it nearly impossible for local farmers to compete. So you have secondhand uh, processed food that comes from Europe that they don't want, they don't want or can't use, or they think they can dump it off for a profit that doesn't fit the uh, standards of European countries. They think they could pass it off on other countries. Um, the plight of Senegalese farmers is particularly poignant. Despite their hard work, they struggle due to lack of basic resources such as irrigation, seeds, draft animals, tractors, and fertilizers. This lack of support is a direct consequence from the structural adjustment policies imposed by the international financial institutions like the IMF, which prioritize debt repayment over investment in uh, infrastructure, agricultural infrastructure. So they lack basic resources to even get started farming, including seeds and tractors and everything like that, because the IMF wants their money and needs it today. And, and they're willing to cripple the country to do it and make permanent changes as well. So let's talk about the, the colonialist history of Senegal, because we've talked about what's going on now. We, we see the debt that they're in, their main commodities, and sort of the motivation for meddling in their affairs. Let's take a look at the, the dark legacy of colonialism in Senegal, okay? So its colonial history is a stark reminder of the brutality and exploitation that characterized Western imperialism in Africa. From the 15th century onwards, European power systematically dismantled Senegal's indigenous political structures and exploited its resources and people for their own gain. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to establish a presence on the Senegalese coast in the mid 15th century. However, it was the French who would leave the deepest, most damaging colonial imprint on Senegal. French colonialization began in earnest in the 17th century with the establishment of trading posts at St. Louis in 1659 and on Goree Island. Uh, some key facts about French colonialization. Um, in 1895, Senegal became a part of the French West Africa with its capital moved to St. Louis to Dakar in 1902. By 1904, France had solidified its control over Senegal through a series of military campaigns against local resistance movements. So moving in and neutralizing the people who live there, of course, this is, you know, right out of the playbook. The French imposed a system of forced labor, compelling the Senegalese farmers to cultivate cash crops for peanuts for export. So as early as the turn of the, the 20th century, they already knew that Senegal was a place to be treated like it's a, it's just just a big greenhouse for you to grow peanuts and then the same more Guatemala was for bananas you know what i mean peanut cultivation increased from 5000 tons in 1840 to 200,000 tons by 1914 so that's uh was that 70 60 70 years uh entrenching french traders while impoverishing local farmers so again this was normal run-of-the-mill, business-as-usual, colonialist uh, bullshit. They wanted to 
take the land, take what was in the land, make the people work for free, and then killed them if they had any kind of problem with it. You know, typical. Um, Latlop Dior, um, who fought against the French expansion in Kaor, was killed in a battle in 1886. Aline Stito Diada led a tax revolt in 1942 and was subsequently arrested and exiled by French authorities. And the Thierry massacre in 1944 saw French forces kill between 35 to 300 Senegalese soldiers demanding equal pay and benefits. So they killed up to 300 people just for asking for equal pay and benefits. Not even that they wanted to dismantle the system or kick out the imperialist influence. No, they just wanted equal pay and benefits, and then they got killed for it. They did the same thing in the United States. This is what capitalism provides. It provides capitalists the ability to squash the working class and give them no bargaining power. I guess everybody kind of starts to see that at least. Um, so cultural uh, imperialism, so kind of cultural imperialism, was another form of violence. In 1848, France granted citizenships to the inhabitants of the four communes, Dakar, St. Louis, Gorry, and uh, Rufisque, uh, creating a small elite separate from the majority of the Senegalese. By 1914, only 5% of school aged children in Senegal were enrolled in French schools as education was primarily used to create a small group of African auxiliaries. So they were only giving education to the people who were going to be the, the Uncle Toms of their, of their time, of their group, somebody who's willing to work the machines and sell out the rest of them. And, you know, there was police in the Warsaw ghettos that were Jewish. They were Jewish police that were that helped herd their fellow Jews to their ultimate demise. And there's always, I talked to Gerald Horn, Professor Horn. He'll tell you with every group, there's always somebody willing to sell them out, right? And he was mentioning Thomas Sowell when I was talking, but nevertheless, there's always somebody who's willing to sell out their own kind. Between 1903 and 1913, Senegal accounted for about 20% of all exports. By 1958, nearly 80% of Senegal's exports went to France. So 80% of everything that Senegal made went to France and for cutthroat prices, I'm sure. While 60% of its imports came from France, so it created this uh, incredibly dependent economy on France. And they've wanted it since. Now you see the ECOWAS states are rising up and you have France starting to wonder where will they get their uranium for their nuclear power plants? I guess you'll just have to wait and see, or you can start paying full price like you should have been the whole time. That means an incredibly, uh, de an incredible decline in the standard of living in Western countries here coming soon. But nevertheless, the imperialism dying off is going to be a good thing for the working class in America and for people abroad. Now, we might get anti-imperialism before we get communism. That's true. We might exhaust ourselves militarily and decide that being domestic and worrying about domestic manufacturing is more important and that we might actually pull out of more countries. Look, we've already pulled out of Afghanistan. Um, we've pulled out of a lot of places. There are places where our influence is waning. And so I can't predict the future, but I, I do know that a communist revolution is still pretty far off. So it's good to look at all possibilities and, and hope for decolonialization, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, whatever it is, whatever good things happen, um, just support them. You know, Senegal gained independence in 1960, but it remained a part of French community maintaining close economic and political ties with France. Uh, the CFA franc introduced in 1945 kept Senegal's currency tied to the French franc, limiting economic sovereignty. So um, we see that the same in a lot of places still using the CFA franc. That should be pretty telltale that you have uh, colonialist residues that should be wiped away. Old, you know, old habits die hard. I think you need to break away from the currency and the governments and, and get the troops. And as of this week, in fact, there was a 
a Senegalese demand from troops that Ukraine and France get their troops out of Senegal once and for all. And uh, we'll go to this video since, uh, since this is the next part. So, oh shit, is that the wrong one? Hang on, give me a second here. Um, yeah, Senegal is an amazing place. It seems really cool. And all the stuff that I've been doing on Africa, I, I think that Africa, completely underrated, misused, abused, and the people from Africa are some of the sweetest and most generous when they come and comment. And and so if you're from Africa, please let me know in the comments and stuff because uh, I'll publish this later. And I'm, I'm always happy to hear about the, the nice words you guys have to say. So here's